Our host today uh, is Assembly Member Marie Waldron. You can see her name up there. If you can't see the person who's talking, you can always use those little scroll buttons on the right and left to see everybody. So Assembly Member, take it away. Great, well, thank you. I'm so excited to have everyone here today. As we all know, everyone has been affected by the C-19 uh, crisis and uh, in various different ways and nonprofits you know, have been affected as much as businesses. And we need to recognize the parity there when we make decisions on, you know, reopening and resources and all of those things uh, and your importance and your essential services that you provide to our community. So I'm very excited to be able to have this webinar today and bring together folks from my district um, and, and the state as well so that we can coordinate our efforts and make sure that we're representing our nonprofits to the best that we can. Um, as we know, nonprofits are stepping up as they always do in a crisis to serve their communities and many nonprofits are providing essential services and other vital programs. So we know that you're struggling to survive financially right now with limited resources of revenue and uncertain government and private funding. And most nonprofits um, who have state contracts haven't heard from the state agencies about whether they will be getting paid on these contracts and changes in performance on these contracts because of the COVID crisis. And those things you know, will also be probably discussed in the budget here. We've got the May revise coming out tomorrow. So you don't know if you're moving forward. Uh, these items are going to be affected. They could be increased costs caused by providing services during the pandemic, costs for increased cleaning, additional equipment, uh, including uh, personal protection equipment. Many nonprofits have not yet been able to access the PPP loans another crisis relief. It's been very difficult. I've been dealing with that issue on the small business task force that the governor has put, uh, put together. And we see that uh, that's one of the number one issues, trying to get capital for small businesses and nonprofits because it's such a uh, laborious task to navigate that whole process. The California Association of Nonprofits a policy alliance of more than 10,000 nonprofits has sent a letter signed by nearly 1,200 organizations to government leaders making recommendations to address these challenges. I, along with 29 other assembly members, signed the letter authored by assembly members Rivas and Limon that supports nonprofits and makes the same requests of state leaders. And, um, you know, we can talk about some of the issues there. And if Jan wants to elaborate a little more on some of the efforts being made at the state level, that would be helpful. Thanks very much, Assembly Member. You know, for everybody who's on this call, you should know that she is really a champion of nonprofits. You know, she just pointed out that she's a signatory to the letter asking the governor to provide some relief for nonprofits, particularly around state contracting in ways that wouldn't cost the state any more money, but that would help thousands of nonprofits in essential services. She's also a member of the Assembly Select Committee on the nonprofit sector. So uh, it's especially fun to get to have a chance to work with her. I just have a couple of housekeeping things and I'm going to introduce uh, quickly the other people who are on our call today. So housekeeping. Everybody's been muted, so you can shout as long as loud as you want or uh, sneeze as loud as you want, and we won't hear you. That's because we just have so many people on this call, we can't have everybody unmuted. There are two boxes at the bottom. One is chat, and the other one says Q&A. The chat box, everybody can see. So if you want something that everybody can see, you can put it in there like people have been putting in their names. If you have a question you want addressed by the panelists, please go ahead and put that in the Q&A box. It makes it easier for us to track 
there uh, what's happening and what's not happening. So thank you. And just to let you know who else is uh, here today. So one is my coworker, Lucy Salcedo Carter. Lucy Wave, so they know which one. Well, I can see your name tag, all right. But anyway, that's Lucy. She's our policy director. Uh, and uh, she knows a lot more of the details of all the kinds of things that we'll be talking about today. Then we have some really great guests um, from the area. One is uh, my old pal, Nancy Sasaki from the United Way. Uh, lots of you know her from her former work at the Alliance for Healthcare and just because she's everywhere <laughs> getting something done or another. Uh, and then we have two local nonprofits. We have Kirk Wilson, sorry, Kirk, um, Free, Kirk Whistler, I'm sorry, of Empowering Latino Futures in North San Diego County. Uh, we have Dr. Rakesh Patel, the CEO of Neighborhood Healthcare throughout Riverside and San Diego counties. And we have Cherry Prestofilippo, who is the founder and president of Cherry for Charity. Um, so I think if you're named Charity, how could you not start a nonprofit called Charity for Charity? Uh, and that's a wish granting organization. So it's great to have some individual perspectives as well. So um, let's see here, where's my agenda? All right, so uh, let me just say a couple more things uh, before we talk about our federal stuff, like, like the assembly member mentioned, the PPP, the um, Paycheck Protection Program. So, uh, Many of you did sign the letter that we mentioned earlier that probably our first priority for our advocacy statewide right now is getting contract relief for nonprofits. I think you probably have all have heard the phrase, you know, nonprofits depend on government money. And it is true that government gives about 30% of the nonprofit community's revenue. But not, government also relies on nonprofits. You know, we, we nonprofits, for example, deliver 32% of Medi-Cal services. And, you know, we've learned about the food chain, you know, which is like in order for food to get to customers, right? There's farmers and there's wholesalers and there's truckers and there's retailers and there's warehouses and there's a whole chain. And, you know, not, we nonprofits, we're actually the services supply chain. So everything that you see, whether it's a food bank or a clinic or a nonprofit theater, um, you're seeing part of a whole ecosystem and a supply chain for our communities. You know, one of the things I really think we're turning every we're all turning our attention to is the economic damage that's happening in California. And um, somebody asked me recently something like, you know, what, what can nonprofits be doing to help restart the economy? And I have to say, like, what do you mean? We are the economy. You know, one in every 14 California jobs is at a nonprofit. We're not like on the margins. We're one in every 14 jobs. We have more jobs than construction. And how many times have we all heard somebody say something like, well, what can we do to increase construction jobs? And so we want to say we are important employers too. And it's very important to us that like the Paycheck Protection Program um, has made available to small businesses and to nonprofits. And that's the second biggest priority for us is making sure that in anything, any kind of relief efforts, nonprofits and for-profits get treated at least as well as nonprofits get treated as least as well as for-profits. That wasn't true in the depression of 1988, 2008. There were a lot of things from the federal government in particular that were made available to small businesses that were not available to nonprofits with the same number of employees. So uh, I think that long, you know, long time efforts by nonprofit advocates have made it possible to do that. I also just wanted to know, even though you can't um, talk out loud in a way that you can hear Nancy, I'm sorry, Lucy is our, our policy director. You can always type questions directly to her and she um, is kind of our local expert on stuff like PPP and EIDL and some of the other issues. So um, let's see. So uh, assembly member, I think we're gonna turn it back to you for some comments about what you're doing in Sacramento. And I noticed you brought up the question about the budget and that the governor's revised budget is coming out tomorrow. And I think uh, given the huge drop in tax revenue that we're seeing, I think a lot of us are scared to death about the budget. And maybe you could tell us something about what, we sh what should we expect, I guess, but what should we be thinking about? Right, um, thank you. Uh, tomorrow's a big day. Uh, our Department of Finance has, uh, is projecting a $54 billion shortfall over the next two years. 
That's really scary. I mean, I was elected to the legislature in 2012, and we've actually enjoyed balanced budgets and surpluses. And, you know, thank you to the foresight of Governor Brown, who supported a rainy day fund. We were able to set aside quite a bit of uh, reserves, and Governor Newsom, in his first year, added to those reserves. So that was very helpful. I mean, the state of California had a a $21 billion surplus going into this C-19 crisis, um, better than most states. You know, a lot of people try to compare us, oh, New York and others, but we were ahead of the game as far as having that reserve, and that will help us. However, there's restrictions on how it can be used. We cannot just wholesalely take all the money. We can only use portions of it in the first year portions of it in the second year. So, um, you know, we're going to be needing assistance from the federal government uh, as we can. Um, I signed a letter with leadership and the governor requesting uh, funding help from the federal government so that we can, you know, help to smooth this as much as we can. Uh, it's going to be tight, but, you know, if we all work together, we can come up with solutions. Um, you know, we continue to have our priorities. Obviously, you know, emergency services needs to be funded. We saw the governor today with uh, the fire, Cal Fire. You know, we, the wildfires are not gonna, you know, change the way they operate based on COVID. So we need to make sure our economy gets back so that we can have resources flowing and philanthropy and things like that to help us as well as education, which is so important, and on and on. Um, you know, I've been working with the governor. He's uh, been very responsive and uh, listens to a lot of ideas. I serve on the task force for the jobs and uh, economy to help try to stimulate and get us back to work and get us back operating. And, um, you know, we are very anxious to get moving through these phases in a safe way to keep everybody safe and to uh, you know continue to to uh, level the curve and move forward. So tomorrow's a big day. There's going to be a lot going on. Um, you know, it's the beginning of the process for the budget. So, do you think that nonprofits should be expecting cuts in the budget? I'm hoping we cannot have to be cut. I mean, my goal is, and what I'm advocating for is efficiencies. You know, we have a lot of things kind of spread out in the state, uh, duplicative efforts. We don't use technology as much as we should. There's things that we could do to streamline the way we operate, reduce redundancy, you know, help us in you know small business nonprofits you know individuals to be able to access resources i mean take the dmv for instance just renewing a driver's license people whose driver's license expired during this time there's we estimated over four to five million people and every uh appointment in the dmv is book solid for a year so how are people going to get a driver's license how are they going to apply for a loan huh? Those are discussions I'm having with the governor now. If we could allow people to, you know, get online, they did do some upgrades, but the person in my family cannot uh, e renew their driver's license online for some reason, <laughs> and uh, it's <laughs> impossible. So I, you know, there's a lot of things like that we need to look at that could save millions and millions of dollars as well as uh, to continue to work with the federal government to try to make sure that we can get resources there. California is a debtor state. We send more taxes back to Washington than we get back. And why should our money be going to, you know, help in other areas of the country when we need it as well here, so. Well, I guess there might be some good things about not getting your driver's license renewed. Like maybe if you make, make somebody else go to the store for you, like <laughs> I'm not going to Target, I can't drive or something like that. So right. those are, but that's you know, what you're saying is extremely sobering about the future economy and the budget. So, and I, even though we know that private dollars just can't 
make up the differences with public that public dollars that government dollars can we still we of course know that private dollars are really important and um, we're very fortunate to have nancy sasaki here from the united way and maybe nancy you can tell us a little bit about you know what you're seeing amount at the united way but also among different foundations and major donors Thank you, Jan. Um, you know, yeah, there's a lot that's happening in the community and there's a lot that has been built up. There's a lot that continues to change. And, you know, I think that one of the real um, struggles right now is the fact that so much of philanthropy is going for the basic needs. And it's absolutely necessary. It's definitely needed, um, but it's wreaking havoc downstream. Um, this crisis is certainly highlighting a lot of the disparities in our community and the fragility of people's lives. And although this, is, this crisis isn't short term, we're kind of funding as if it is. Um, so knowing that these disparities are happening and seeing them in the community also shines a light on where philanthropy can make a difference. Um, disparities that are highlighted are the ones that we really need to pay attention to. Of course, there are the ones everybody's seeing, whether it's the uh, that are really prominent, the financial health or the lack thereof of individuals, as well as the general health conditions that are weak, um, reliance on our essential workers, yet they're the ones probably making the lowest wages in our community. Um, but not just those that are around getting health care, but also those that allow us to be able to live at home, to be able to work from home. That means our food keeps coming, our electricity keeps getting turned on, our trash keeps getting picked up. Those are the essential workers that are out there but there are many others and some that don't get that kind of a limelight. There are people that cannot live safely in their homes, whether it's because of domestic violence or potentially even child abuse. There are those that can't learn from home. They may not have the access. They may not have a schedule that allows them to. There is a heavy reliance right now on parents assistance in that learning process. And these parents may or may not have the time and they may not have the ability there are those who don't have a home to go to. That's been really interesting with our workers assistance initiative that we started on March the 16th to enable and support low wage workers in their rent and mortgage as well as utilities and food. And even that has the definition of those in need has changed since we started it on March the 16th. Certainly the unemployment benefits and the bonuses have really helped low wage workers to be unemployed but there are still people in our community that are left out from those benefits. And those are the ones we're trying to identify now as being the most in need. But there is also, as y'all have been talking about, a huge impact on nonprofits, especially the smaller ones, because of a heightened concern on about basic needs. And uh, right now, there are many philanthropists that are pivoting their priorities and they're abandoning the traditional needs and supports. There are some low grade rumblings that I'm beginning to hear out there about small nonprofits merging. And the thing about that is we would never say that to a small business. So why are we saying it to our nonprofits? I think one of the things that we could shift in thinking there is that support the larger nonprofits to help and nurture these smaller nonprofits so they have the wherewithal to sustain themselves over a longer period of time. We've also found that in our work with the census that it's many times that these smaller nonprofits are really the trusted messenger in these communities. They're also the trusted voice for those who are voiceless in our society. It's in times of crisis that this, these not smaller nonprofits are the ones that the residents turn to for their information. They're the only conduit that they have to the, the services that are out there to not only help them thrive, but really just to survive. Um, and and um, these smaller nonprofits and nonprofits in general are the primary conduit for governmental support to get that aid to the people that are in need. And we need these nonprofits to bridge that gap between funding sources and community realities. That said, we won't be able to save them all. So I think it's really incumbent upon leadership as well as residents in the community to come together in some sort of collective think tank to talk about how do we thrive and sustain the nonprofits in our community? How do we ensure that the voice of the residents are being heard? And then on top of that, we are not preparing for the second wave. And I'm not talking about the second wave of the pandemic, but the second wave of the hardships that are a result of not working. The next wave of layoffs that may happen because PPP money runs out. 
because unemployment insurance ends. Um, people are not using familiar types of systems right now. So when this, when we start to come back into it, what systems are going to be there? What systems have, have been damaged? Um, we haven't talked about the mental health of people in this particular crisis and that there are some, I was on a webinar recently where they were talking about if you're in go mode and you're like protecting your mission and you're just doing everything that you can, you haven't taken the time to realize what impact this, this working from home and this whole change and this whole pandemic has had on you as an individual. So I think down the road, we're gonna have some huge impacts on mental health. They do talk about PTSD in our, in our healthcare workers, but there are people that are right now living in their homes, working from their homes that will have that same impact. Um, but we've also, it's not all of this uh, doom and gloom as it sounds like I'm talking about. We've really seen some real bright spots, especially around public and private partnerships, trying to work together in ways that are very different than they have been in the past. Um, we've seen incredible pivots in our community organizations so that they can better serve the community. And philanthropy is really needed to help in those shifts but philanthropy will need to be there in the future when we shift back to, or we shift to whatever we call the new normal and what that future holds. I'm really of the firm belief that we cannot sit here and see these disparities that are happening in our community to be living them and allow any dulling of our senses in the future, whether it's three months, six months, or a year from now, we actually have a real opportunity to build a stronger community and that we should recognize that and create the new normal from there. And we will absolutely need philanthropy as our partner. And that's what I have to say. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Assembly member, do you want to make some comments about that and maybe also um, then introduce um, our, our other guests from nonprofits? Okay. Um, you know, it's. Uh, going to be an uphill battle for sure and I hate to use the word the new normal because I'm really hoping that we can quickly get back to normalcy um, I think people are anxious for that I just don't know that it's going to be the same and I know the governor has said it's just not going to be the same so who knows we may end up having more people working out of their homes because they're used to it now they see they can do it may cut costs for overhead for businesses, things like that. So, I mean, you know, just trying to um, support our nonprofits and, and actually educate ourselves, educate elected officials on, you know, the issues that you're facing as well as, you know, how you can apply for support and what resources are, re are available is gonna be important going forward in the long run. So I agree with, with that. Um, now uh, it's an important time we uh, can talk about some of the experiences that our nonprofits are actually uh, being affected by on the ground um, around my district and to learn about some of the barriers and some of the challenges that they are facing. Um, and we'd like to start with neighborhood health care. Dr. Patel. Um, give us an idea of the situation you're experiencing on the ground in the district, any observations and unique concerns? Sure. Thank you for the opportunity. So um, we were kind of, I was looking back at, as COVID started and for us, uh, it was March 16th when it was a pivotal um, change for us in our organization. And that's where we basically overnight converted our health centers from seeing patients face to face 100% of the time to almost all virtual visits, uh, which was a completely really new thing for us. Um, in the, in the, the previous reimbursement model under Medi-Cal, we weren't, we weren't really allowed to bill for virtual visits. And if we did, it was only between two of our locations. And now we were given that opportunity to actually connect into patients' homes, um, either via video or via phone. And um, normally we see about 13 hip, 100 visits per day in the different sites that we have. Um, looking at the numbers post COVID, we're actually about at the same number at this point. And really what we saw our role in the, the community was one, we, we take care of about 70,000 patients, 10% of them being diabetics. And really our key role as we looked at where 
COVID and where we fit was to make sure that our patients remained healthy as best as we could. So they didn't u utilize the ER or go to the hospital. We actually tested those patients who were at high risk for COVID or showing symptoms and were able to do testing and continue to do testing. But really wanted to make sure we're triaging people into the right places of care and, and, and keep them out of the hospital, which we've been successful in doing largely. Concern is that I think in, in the messaging to patients across the, the various counties is this fear that they're not going to seek care when they need to for heart attacks, strokes, and things like that with the fear of going to the hospital. And it's really hard to measure that. And I think that's an ongoing concern that we continue to face. Um, as we've done more virtual visits, you know, one of the big barriers has been technology on the side of patients. Um, we'd love to do more video visits. Um, we, we're trying to pilot that. I was doing some video visits a couple weeks ago, talking with a, a young gentleman with a sore throat, trying to look in his throat through video. And it, it broke up three times as we're seeing, the, um, seeing him and finally kind of said, all right, send me a picture and text it to me and trying to figure out ways to provide care. But largely we've been able to provide a lot of great care to our patients. What we've been, uh, one of the things that we measure is um, patient satisfaction. And we've gone up 10 points during COVID for our patients, something that we were kind of trying to do for the entire year. And within two months, I've seen a huge surge in that. And it's really the patients have told us, you know, you didn't make us come to your clinic and possibly get sick by being in the practice. You addressed our needs. We felt connected. I think there's this intimacy of what with these Zoom calls where the doctor is calling you and you're in your living room. And they, they appreciated that conversation. And then what's been really fascinating is around our behavioral health patients where Historically, they've been really hard to get into our offices because just all the social dysfunctions and the barriers, especially transportation, we're actually now having no share rates of less than 10% in our behavioral health population. And getting them on medication, seeing them more frequently, seeing improvement, getting to interact with the families, and, and really excited with that, um, where we're getting to utilize our staff and do the, provide the care that's so needed in the mental health space. Um, our, our biggest concerns, you know, one, of course, is we fully anticipate this budget that there's going to be cuts to Medi-Cal. Uh, you know, in the last recession, we saw that in 2008 and 9 with the removal of adult dental, um, some of the other optional benefits. And uh, at the same time, we're projecting 2.2 is the latest number I saw, a new million, 2.2 uh, million new Medi-Cal enrollees um, as a result of this unemployment. And, and where's that access gonna be? And then what's the benefits that we'll be able to provide them? And so I think that's concerning. I think we got through this initial onslaught of COVID and figured out, we got, luckily we got some federal funding. Obviously there's still gaps, but we're kind of right-sizing and figuring that out. And now it's the long-term of, okay, what's, what's reimbursement gonna look like in the, in the starting July? Um, for a lot of health centers, dental, some of the chiropractor services that we, we provide, not only are great for patients, but they also help us keep our doors open and, and, and leverage some of the other services that, that barely break even for us. And so that's an ongoing concern. I'd be remiss to not talk about PPE, not PPP, but PPE, which the personal protective equipment, so masks and 95s, continues to be an ongoing challenge. Um, you know, as we start to open up, um, we're, we're projecting our burn rates and, and trying to get supply. You know, I think what we've seen is a lot of great community partners. Um, one of our mottos is better together, and that's really lived through where we've got churches making masks for us, other nonprofits donating. We actually at one point had extra masks, so we donated some to Palomar. Um, so we're all really in this together, and I think that's gonna be an ongoing challenge. Hopefully, as supply chains and improve, that will be less of an issue, but I think it's something, especially as we increase dental services now that that's been allowed. Um, and, and, you know, the other is testing, of course, and figuring out what the role of testing is and hopefully having some better tests that make sense um, as we kind of need to do that as well and, and have a more cohesive testing policy. Because I think, I think we all want to open up society. I think, it, it, you know, I think it's to the detriment, as we talked about. I think Nancy articulated a lot of that. But we also want to make sure it's done in a safe way. And I think it's, it's that balance. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll see, you know, as we, we hear what's happening at, at the border, um, makes us really concerned and, and, and hopefully we can control that and uh, see where things go. But I think, um, I, I think it's in times like this where we see the benefits of nonprofits. We're, we've been working with various partners like Interfaith here in the county as well in Escondido to, to serve special populations, get them tested as needed, and, um, 
um, you know, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist. You have to be in healthcare. Um, and so I think through this, you know, I think one of the things that you mentioned about is efficiencies. And I, I would implore you to figure out how to keep us allowing us to do virtual visits uh, in the Medicaid space. I think it's what patients desire. It's, it's better care. It's lower cost. Um, I think it speaks to all those things. And I think it's, it would be a shame to go backwards. You know, this forced the issue. And I think it's time to move forward, use the momentum to, to redefine how we deliver care to this space. Because, you know, I, talking about disparities, if you go to Kaiser, a lot of it's virtual. Most of their visits are 60% virtual at this point. Why aren't we doing that in these other spaces? I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Great, thank you, Dr. Patel. Um, very uh, informative. Actually, I, I wished I had taped what you said because some of the things you said I like to tweet out. <laughs> um, uh, next up, we have Charity Filippo with Charity for Charity. And uh, tell us a little bit about the good works you do up in Riverside area and uh, some of the obstacles that you're facing. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm just a little guy <laughs> in Temecula. We have one employee and uh, we are a wish fulfilling organization. And we were really blessed to have our big event in February, right before everything happened. So we had a very successful event um, it's our biggest event of the year, yet we fulfill wishes for individuals with life-threatening illness or traumatic injury. So when I, when I hear what everybody else is doing, I'm like, gosh, wow, we're not, you know, we're not saving lives and we're not doing this, but yet we are because we offer hope and um, inspiration to people. But what happened was in February, we committed these wish fulfillments to, um, there's two cancer patients and then, um, another young man who had a brain injury and a lot of times time is at the essence to be able to fulfill these wishes so that we can do it before you know god forbid they, something happens and um and we're put on hold now so and then we're afraid to spend funds in any other direction because when this is over we need to fulfill these wishes um you know god willing that we can and so you know our hands are tied Yes, we actually did have funds from our big event. That wasn't canceled. Um, but now we're afraid to move because we don't know how long this is gonna last and we don't know what tomorrow holds. And you know, it's really confusing, as you all know, <laughs> to try to find that information. Um, it's obviously changing daily and um, there's nothing we can bank on. So we just find that our hands are tied. And then throughout the year, you know, we, we do do other events that help bring in money and keep us afloat. And, and we can't do that. We did apply for the PPP and we got it. Um, so that was awesome. I wouldn't have known we could do that thanks to the bank. They told us. Um, I think that's something that if we could get that out there and more nonprofits can know how, you know, that they qualify. I, I have three businesses that qualify but I didn't even think about it, um, about a nonprofit being able to qualify. So that's helpful, yet you have to use it for payroll. And of course, all these employees don't wanna come back to work because they're making double the money. <laughs> so if I can't use it on payroll and I can only use 25% for rent and, and our overhead expenses, then how is this gonna play out? You know, How am I going to be able to use the money for payroll and then get to use the rest of it um if i can't get my employee to come back <laughs> to work for you know half the money so we find and i find that in the in my business as well we're, we're facing this position of not knowing how to do this so um we're just hopeful that we're going to either extend the deadline for how we can use that ppp or flex be flexible with the percentages we could use it so we're really banking on that. Um, I also reached out because we are, we're small. I mean, we're not, we're small, but I, I have really close relationships. If you guys have heard of Michelle's Place, it's cancer, um, a cancer center. And um, our Nicholas Foundation is autism. It's an organization supporting autism. And I asked them, I said, I'm going to be in this. Can you just tell me from your perspective how this is affecting you? So I just wanted to read just a little, two paragraphs from each of them. For our Nicholas Foundation, the biggest impact they've seen is the cancellation of the fundraisers. 
directly impacting their programs moving forward. They aren't a huge machine, but without their events like their walk for autism and other sponsorships, they've had to take a close look at the model going forward and their sustainability. Also, their programs are 100% volunteer driven and many of them uh, require large group setting. So they're not able to proceed at this time. And um, for a lot of these autistic kids, you know, they, this is something they look forward to. It's a huge outlet for them and it's something that these families look forward to as well. So their special needs population requires a unique approach. And he said um, the biggest area of deficit now is going forward school related virtual school doesn't work well with autistic kids that need structure and the funding isn't there from the district to make it work efficiently so that's from mark and then um kim from michelle's place said their impact is dramatic they've had to close the center and completely change the way they serve um you know their cancer patients um, they have virtual support groups they're providing groceries and essentials. Their navigators are calling all of their clients to provide support and resources. Obviously, fundraisers are canceled or postponed. So they're trying to find ways to engage and raise funds. It's different, but in the end, um, you know, she's having to keep in a positive attitude. So, you know, with us not, and then even with my, you know, coming in February is my annual event again. So when can I start planning? Can I start planning? You know, those are the things we're faced with having my uh, beneficiaries we have events to keep them plugged in and support it throughout the year and we can't do that so i'm going to plan a zoom meeting but it's just not the same people need that human touch and so we're really missing that thank you charity um i like the to hear that perspective from um your group as well as the others in my district um i'm excited that we have Empowering Latino Futures joining us. And um, Kirk Whistler, if you could give us an update on some of the challenges that your organization is facing. Oh, you're on mute. Kirk, you need to unmute yourself, Kirk. Yeah. All right. Thank you for including Empowering Latino Futures. We operate a variety of local and national programs. Some of us have been impacted in major ways that have hurt our finances. Uh, we held oh, 67 Latino book and family festivals over the past two decades with over 900,000 attendees combined but our festivals for this year are basically canceled. And uh, our next one was actually gonna be in October over at Maricosta College. And uh, can't, can't be doing it. We'll, we will certainly be doing virtual things around it, but that, that impacts our efforts. Our education begins in the home program that Edward Becerra heads has canceled over 40 events across North San Diego County where they would have uh, distributed free books to low-income kids. And these events serve thousands of people. With our International Latino Book Awards, one of the largest book awards in the world, it's actually, we're on course to do better this year with that. But the award ceremony, which it was scheduled for September, will most likely be a virtual award ceremony. Uh, we do an award-winning author tour where we have a number of events that we have uh, authors at, and those have all been canceled. But there we've created a podcast, uh, Para Los Niños podcast, with award-winning children's book authors reading their books and that and that's been very popular nonprofit concerns we are experiencing seeing with others and hearing include we we salute the nonprofits that are dealing with the frontline issues providing health care housing food to those in need uh, many funding sources have stepped forward to help those type of nonprofits far fewer sources are available for arts and education nonprofits what are the alternatives? 
in particular preschool programs and programs dealing with helping Latino and other underserved children getting into and going to college have been particularly hard hit. Nonprofits where much of their staff are contractors are left out of the PPP plan. Where can they get help? We work closely with a number of local libraries, always a great ally of nonprofits. How are the libraries going to fare in the coming months as governments deal with far less revenues? I'm afraid we'll see some major cuts there. If this economic situation is truly a long-term downturn, we will lose a generation of our underserved youth unless these type of needs are addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk. You know, we have a zillion questions, so I'm going to skip right to starting to ask people. And I think uh, some of them are specially for the assembly member, but I hope that uh, anyone else who wants to chime in can. So one of the questions, assembly member Waldron, is, um, is the state considering something like the federal PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program? Um, and then sort of in parallel, maybe this is a question for you, Lucy, you know, is, is it still, is it too late to apply to the federal PPP program? Assembly member, you want to jump in or would you like me to jump in? Let's see. Well, you can start because I'm trying to figure out if I'm muted or not. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good, but I'll start. Okay. okay. So, um, so as you all know, there was, uh, with the CARES Act, in, on March 27th, the federal government started a new small business administration program called the Paycheck Protection Plan. And that first round of money has run out, but then there was an interim spending bill that happened on April 24th, where there was new money put into the PPP pot, and there is still money there. I checked the sba.gov website today, and they are still open for business. So Charity mentioned the PPP, the assembly member has mentioned it. It's, it's, it has its limits. It's limited to nonprofits that have um, up to 500 employees. And it is, you ha have to use at least 75% of the funds for payroll in order to have it forgiven. But it is a forgivable loan. Um, it's, eight, it's for eight weeks. And I know that there's been talk at the federal level of expanding the program beyond um, nonprofits that are, that are smaller so that the larger ones can be included and also potentially opening it up to longer than eight weeks. But if you haven't applied, do apply. You work with a bank or some other um, a, a lending institution. With the new round of funding, there are smaller lending institutions available to work with and they, they are really happier to work with nonprofits, if, but if you have a bank that you've been working really closely with, work with your, your bank. It was great to hear from Charity that the bank approached you and let you know about this opportunity. Um, that's probably fairly rare, um, but you can approach your bank. Um, the application is online. It's an easy application. You can also look for a lender online on sba.gov. So really encourage you to apply. There's still money in that second pot. So um, if you, you think that you would qualify and that you could use it, um, it's a great opportunity. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Assembly Member. Sure. Um, well, the state has various resources. Um, you know, they, they don't really go into the, the same kind of scope as that federal program. And, um, you know, just uh, the governor has a website up that has all of the different resources and questions regarding COVID. Um, one of the things is the, they have throughout the state, the grant makers, uh, philanthropy, California teams are uh, operational and telecommuting. They're trying to be as fully operational as possible. Um, they have a Southern California Grant Makers Program. I don't know if, if you've utilized that, um, socalgrantmakers.org. They, they are um, trying to keep up with demand. There's uh, various financial help from student loan relief to unemployment insurance uh, relief, paid family leave, disability insurance, 
some relief from financial institutions. And I was just talking to the governor recently about, you know, the unemployment insurance issue is going to be just massive when people get back to work and, you know, businesses have to pay that cost. So how are we going to deal with that? How are we going to defer some of that? Um, you know, the, another thing that the state is doing is trying to help because a lot of uh, businesses and nonprofits who maybe are not working because they weren't considered essential at the time are going to have to plan on how they're going to come back. They can't just one day open the doors. There's lots of criteria that have to be met for safety. Um, so the state um, is trying to help with that and help in planning so that you know you can get open and get working as soon as possible. Um, there's uh, just so much information. It's almost, you almost need to have an ombudsman to kind of navigate a lot of it, unfortunately. Um, one of the things that's really going to be important is the testing to make sure, you know, we know our status. And also um, another thing the state has been trying to do is make sure that meals are available, especially for seniors and that, you know, we're looking at um, across the board needs for especially our most vulnerable populations. And that's been, you know, one of the keys, one of the six key indicators that the governor brought out is our most vulnerable uh, populations. And, you know, that includes seniors, includes uh, incarcerated, and includes uh, people who are in institutions, um, as well as our students who would be in school in, in large groups. So those are um, the concerns of the state at this point. Thank you. You know, it is interesting that, you know, nonprofits are on kind of both ends of the spectrum. So on one hand, we have people like the food banks and Meals on Wheels and clinics working overtime, with huge demand. And on the other hand, our theaters and our community centers are all closed. And so nonprofits are kind of everywhere on that whole spectrum. But we, we also had advanced questions, as I think everybody knew. And so there are actually three questions that are almost the same, one from a community center, one from the gay men's course, um, and one from the church. And that is, when can we open? And, uh, and what guidelines are there are going to be um, available in terms of what we might have to do before, when we can open. And this is a question in Riverside. Um, I'm sorry for getting the other county. Um, so maybe you, can speak to, maybe you don't know, but I think it's, this is a question that a lot of people have on their minds. Um, yeah, I can jump in. Uh, <sighs> I know that the governor uh, on Friday moved to phase two. Some mm -hmm. counties do that are able to go deeper. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. the goal is really to get through phase two into phase three. Phase three uh, includes a lot of the uh, more uh, uh, gatherings, you know, even casinos. I have eight tribal governments in, in this district, including five gaming, and they're very concerned about, you know, when their revenue streams can come back. We're looking at you know, reopening schools, those type of uh, bigger gatherings. So um, there's kind of a tug back and forth between counties and the state. The County Department of Health has an enormous amount of authority over these decisions. And, you know, I think it's important that we look regionally because we in Southern California and Southwest Riverside do not have near the cases that LA or San Francisco are experiencing. So we should be able to, um, you know, make sure that we are safely uh, looking at when we can get everything reopened um, based on the data. And, uh, you know, our hope is that the state will continue to listen. Um, you know, there is that tug of war going on right now, but uh, Department of Health in each county has an enormous amount of authority uh, overriding a lot of the state mandates as well. So, you know, we, we have to look to them, but my goal, you know, is to really make sure our economy is moving. And that's uh, one of the reasons that I sit on the subcommittee for small business 
that the governor set up as well as the task force for jobs and economy we had a 60-day window to get things going we're already two weeks in and you know as soon as ideas are coming up they're starting to implement them um, i was very encouraged that you know within two or three days the governor was able to move to phase two based on some of the things that we were seeing with the data so you know I, I was hoping we could, it's just my personal opinion, I was hoping we could be to phase two by Memorial weekend. I mean, it's, it's, it's getting there. So, you know, I think everyone has done a great job working together on it. Well, and I was hoping you were gonna say something like, you know, 4 p.m. on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we have to kind of settle with uh, a more sensible answer. Um, Nancy, do you want to add something to the, this comment by the assembly member or the one before and then uh, Dr. Yeah, it was, yeah, it Tell was it. a little bit of the one before and, and there was some comment made about how successfully nonprofits were able to pivot and begin working from home. And I think it's really important to understand that nonprofits did that very, very quickly. And there are things that now as we look at this as a kind of a long term, longer term than what we thought when we just quickly moved to working from home. And that is from one of the things that I think about, especially for my organization, is I have people that have other roommates and so their office is now sitting in the center of their bed, hunched over a laptop. And when you start thinking about the, um, the workers' comps claims that could come from that, we need to be able to ensure that no matter what their home life setup is, that it is something that is ergonomically sound, that is something that they can be in a safe place, that they are not prone to more injuries. The wires are all hooked up appropriately and, and hidden away. So there is a definitely a concern there. It's also that in that move, although I don't know how all of the nonprofits did it, there are some IT, IT security concerns that we have because people took equipment home and they are now working on their own home internet systems many times. If they're not connected into a VPN type of, of opportunity, then you've got cybersecurity um, concerns. And as much as I know, because uh, we've surveyed our staff about how much they enjoy working from home, they like that flexibility. They like being trusted that they're doing their work from home, but, uh, but there are things that they miss about working in the office. I think we will go to something that's somewhat of a hybrid, but we need to ensure that the work environment at home is just as safe as it is um, for where they work in the office. I think that's a really important, and those are costs that we as nonprofits will have to incur in order to be able to be flexible in what we're learning can work and what can't. We're actually having a hard time finding hand sanitizer. One of the things that we know coming back into the office, people will have to use hand sanitizer in movement. They'll have to use masks if they walk out of their office, those kinds of things. Um, we need to make sure we have a long enough supply because we don't know how long this is going to last and how long we're gonna to need to do those kinds of uh, protective measures. Wow. You know, Dr. Patel, maybe I think all of us would always like to hear, you know, what, um, what people from the health clinic have to advise all of us, and also what messages does the health nonprofit community have for the assembly member and other uh, people in California state government? You know, one of, um, wearing my other hat, I'm part of the Medical Society, and, and one of the concerns that we have with the governor's um, phase reopening is his mandate of no deaths for 14 days. And I think it's really unrealistic, actually. And so We've asked that they relook at that because I think that will become a, re a real barrier to us actually opening up if that's held into place because you can have people die from weeks of being on a ventilator and all of a sudden now we're back to restarting. So I would, at, you know, from the medical society, we're wondering where he's getting some of that advice from and hopefully he can get some better advice in that area. Um, you know, I think it would be really nice to have a more cohesive testing strategy that's, it's, you know, every... What we do in San Diego County versus Riverside County is, is very different. Um, and it's really confusing for patients as well. In one county, you know, we're gonna test everybody because we're trying to meet the threshold for numbers in another county. Well, we don't have enough tests or it doesn't quite make sense. And so it's for our patients who already struggle with medical education and information, it really causes a lot of confusion and it actually causes more fear and anxiety for a lot of people. Um, so I think that's something that I'd like to get addressed. You know, I think. Luckily for us, we've built relationships with our patients or we're able to counsel those. But right now, there's just a lot of patients that are lost. You know, people are losing insurance 
um, they're in this abyss and there's not a lot of information. And then when you think about health literacy and um, non-English speaking patients, um, it's really confusing. One of the populations we take care of is a largely Arabic population. And we've really created a lot more um, bilingual information for that population because there's not a lot of resources, whether it be radio or television, um, and they're just hungry for, for information that's accurate. Um, I would stress, you know, from a public health standpoint, social distancing does make a difference. Obviously, washing your hands, wearing masks, we need to do all keep doing those things. We are really concerned, obviously, what the fall brings when we bring flu back and then the next phase of this. And so um, hopefully we're obviously better prepared to deal with that. But I think there's also going to be a lot of frustration as this kind of restarts again. But, you know, I think we're all kind of done with this. We're, we're, but I think this, you know, sadly, this is this is normal now. We, we don't want to call it the new normal, but this is normal. And it's going to be that way for a while. You know, I think the vaccine is a, a great pipe dream, but we've never had a vaccine this quickly come on board. Um, and the coronavirus is the same virus as the common cold. We don't have a vaccine for that. So I think we need to take some heed in thinking about just our long term and the pipe dream that we're going to have testing for all, vaccines for all. I think I think we need to be prepared for a little bit longer haul in this entity. No, I'm sorry. I don't know if I can just jump in here, but you know, I also had made a note that um, in the education field, there is a lot that's being done so that kids are learning online, but we are also concerned that they've made a statement that people's grades are what they were when they left, but we really need to be able to assess how much slide and regression kids have gone through in the time frame that they have not really been learning. There are a lot of people in education that are saying they're not learning right now, they're being enriched. And so how do we measure what that slide might have been with our kids? Because they are our future and we need them to be hitting their education milestones. And unfortunately, there are a lot of children who are not meeting those milestones pre-COVID. And I'm afraid that that's going to be really seriously impacted post-COVID. Assembly member, we have one time for one last question. Um, we have a quick question from Caitlin at the food bank. And she says, you know, we'd like to be able to do more flexibility, but they need to buy new technology. So first they have 10 year old desktop computers right now. They don't have the money to give employees uh, computers that they can use at home. And I think this is true, not just in essential services, but for a lot of nonprofits. And, and Dr. Patel also mentioned the fact that so many of the people that we serve don't also don't have the technology. What kinds of things is the state doing or what, should, what can we be advocating for to help out on this you know, technology gap, both in nonprofits and in communities? Yes, um, that's a really important question, in fact, I brought it up yesterday at our subcommittee meeting for small business. Districts like ours, especially, where so much of the, the land mass is rural um, or even agricultural, um, we need to be cognizant of that as well as our underserved communities being able to access broadband, internet, and new technologies. In fact, um, I've run legislation several years in a row and we'll continue to do that to modernize our government system. Um, we had a bill about two years ago where um, we are looking at putting in and implementing and helping to uh, streamline the installation of updated internet and digital communications into rural areas. And you know, when people in Sacramento think of rural areas, they're not thinking of San Diego and Southwest Riverside. They're thinking of Northern California, uh, you know, Lassen County and Modoc and those areas. So I made sure that I stood up on the assembly floor and let people know that you know, Southern California, in fact, has many areas that do not have adequate internet. I mean, our kids can't download sufficient um, files for their schools and our nonprofits, as was pointed out, are struggling to be able to access resources and be able to communicate and do the things they need to do because of this issue. So um, it ended up being one of our top five categories for the small business roundtable that we had yesterday that we are bringing to the governor. Actually, the governor's office uh, facilitates the meeting. So that's gonna be one of the things I'll be talking to the governor directly about 
and we are going to try to push. Um, he had set up a whole department to look at modernizing government. And that was when he first got in and then was hit with all the wildfires and it never really got to take off. But now is the time that we need to do that because it's going to be very essential going forward. Yeah, piggybacking on that, my wife teaches second grade in uh, Vista in a school that's 85% Latino. And she has several students who are in homes the family is renting space from another family and that family that they're renting from doesn't allow them to use the internet because it slows down their side of the internet. And so those are the kind of problems that somehow have to be addressed. Thanks, Kirk. That's a great comment. Um, so you know what, we're out of time. Um, and I want to encourage everybody to stay in touch with us at the California Association of Nonprofits. I want to encourage you to stay in touch um, with the um, assembly member and with your other elected officials, they need to hear from you. And uh, assembly member, can we ask you to wrap this up for all of us? Sure. Um, I really appreciate the time you spent today. Um, this is not the end of the discussion by any means. Um, the Cal Nonprofits Association has all the questions that were put up. Not everything um, could be answered, but you know we will take all of that into consideration as we move forward. And it's so helpful to hear from you and get those comments. And that's what's cool about having this chat option because we can write everything down that you know, we can know uh, more directly what you're facing so that I can advocate for you up in Sacramento. But thank you all for um, attending today and that concludes our webinar. <laughs>